Previously on Talking Joe. And it's about 10 minutes away from hitting this castle. I'm about to get my Joes out, position them all around this castle, unlike some sort of silent castle siege, and see if the, the uh, seawater, the tide, can collapse it all. I've gone to my bag, which was positioned about 10 metres away from the sand castle. Three nine or ten year old girls come running over, trampled the whole castle. Oh, what do you yeah. do, Chief? Your blood must have boiled, but you well, dare not be that old coot. Ah, you little shit! No. Talking Joe is on the air, and here are your hosts, Chief and Mark. Hey, 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 it's me, Chief Dog. You can't stop talking Joe, that's right, and uh, I am here with my new co-host, uh, it's Mr. Mark Seddon. How are you, sir? Very good. Hey, 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 everyone. <laughs> Excellent. Welcome, everyone, to Mark. Listen, uh, let's cut to the chase. Uh, let's find out your creds, because you have jumped into this puppy. Uh, S-Jub's body is still cold on the slab. He's not even planted six feet under yet, and you're already in the hot seat. So, I'd uh, say warm. Warm, if anything. <laughs> he's, he's kept it warm for you. <laughs> let's find out. Straight up front, uh, your credentials. What's your Joe creds? What's your your bona fides? Where are you coming from? And uh, what experience have you got to be alongside the legendary Chief Doggy Dog in the Talking Joe studio? It's, it sounds like you've regretted not looking at my CV. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it's all, by his regret. All, all kidding aside, uh, Mark is a um, friend of the show, one of the uh, opening, one of the... Um, Founding people on the Talking Joe uh, Facebook group, uh, contributor, uh, a friend of mine personally, and um, very well versed in the world of Joe. And yet again, I feel like uh, when when I was on with Ben, I felt like I had this superior uh, Joe knowledge. At least. But now, <laughs> now uh, with Mark coming on, I feel like for th- three times in a row, I'm actually um, going to be bowing down to his knowledge. But um, yeah, tell us about Joe for you in your childhood, and you know all the different content and how what it meant for you. Yeah, so so sort of firstly, yeah, big fan of the show. We've sort of been discussing the the show since before it even began, and, he, and even been discussing whether I join join on the on the show before now. So so it's sort of a yeah a long a long time uh, a long time that we that we've been talking about all this this stuff. Big fan yep. of the show, been part of that that ride. Loved the the work that Ben, Chris, S. Jobs have done. I love Ben's enthusiasm and and that ability to keep you in check. You know. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, all of all of Chris's bedoying, you know, I'm not necessarily going to replace that, but I could try and all of uh, Steve's sesquipedalian loquaciousness, you might say. Uh, nice. Um, so yeah, I've uh, <laughs> yeah, I've been a big uh, fan of GI Joe, big fan of the pods, real world friends for quite a number of years now. So yeah. I thought I'm going to cut they... you off there. I, did we meet at Roll Out Roll Call convention? Yeah, in that was. That was the first time that we met at that, ah. that rollout roll call. I'd met and your brother at um, Thought Bubble, I think, the year before. Maybe or not? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you'd met Peter once okay. before at Thought Bubble, I think, and, and made an impression on him. And <laughs> uh, yeah, we sort of he introduced us and sort of got got chatting. And, and I saw your GI Joe binds and was like, "What that's magic right. is this?" That's right. And I yeah. think that's what sealed it. Was going this this guy has yeah. got the stuff. <laughs> but, you, but you were a, you were a comic fan, you know, from childhood as well. And yeah, was so, Joe? Did you have the toys as a kid? Absolutely. So so I I think what really uh, it's sort of about the same time I really uh, got into Joe. It was probably around 1985, at the age of about seven, and I was getting the Battle Action Force uh, weekly comics. I was getting a uh, subscription from the local news agent where they'd, you know, write your address on the top corner of the of the book, and you'd get it sort of shoved through your letterbox. And yeah, that that, that only sort of lasted until November 1986. So it was quite an actual short period that I was collecting it, but it felt it felt like forever. Uh, yeah. forever. And I was, I was like getting into the uh, toys around about that, that same period. And yeah, like you, I think, like one of my very first ones was Mutt with Junkyard. Oh, on wicked. The, on the Palatoy uh, box. And do, you, do you have any of those older Joes still? Uh, I don't, yeah, so we could get, get into that in a second. I'll talk okay. about the, the, okay. the toys. But, uh, yeah, the so after the Bad Selection Force uh, was cancelled, it was, like, sort of devastating to, to me. They In the pages of that battle, they tried to replace it because they'd lost the licence with a thing called Storm Force, uh, which, you know, it had Vanyo on art, so it was still very good, but it wasn't, wasn't yeah. the same until and it felt like it had been gone for years and years and years. And I just looked at the dates, and it, so it was off the shelves in November 1986. 
Marvel UK started again February 1987, so just a handful of months. But as a, a young right. seven-year-old, it felt like I was in mourning that I'd missed this, <laughs> lost this massive thing from my life. It was, you know, it's only a handful of mo- months. It was, you know, uh, around about the same time to cover a four-issue art on one podcast. Yeah, right. And then it just sort of, you know. You don't have exposure at that, I guess, that age, but also that time about what's in the pipeline in terms of comics coming out and uh, toys coming out and stuff like that. So, so when I saw uh, the Action Force UK comic, that was just like, whoa, where's this come from? This is amazing. And, and, and along with it, all of the G.I. Joe uh, toys that that first uh, Hasbro wave with, you know, Duke, uh, not Duke, uh, Flint and uh, Snake Eyes and all of those guys. And yeah, it was yep. sort of ravenous about collecting G.I. Joe toys, could try to get as as many as as I could. Like Chris had a, an amazing trip to uh, the States where I scooped up basically the entirety of uh, the uh, the year's releases that, nice. <laughs> that, were, that were there that year. So I got like the uh, Sergeant Slaughter with his Warthog as, as a vehicle and almost all of the the carded figures that could find in in Toys R Us, which was just like this incredible toy palace that they visited, and then ha- and uh, obviously getting the GI Joe comics as as well. Once I discovered that the you know American Marvel comics I- existed and, and got the entire run up to one five five at the the time, and then it all came back with Devil's Due, and that sort of reignited my my interest, and I sort of familiar, you know, for it, re-familiarized myself with with the the, the toys and the, yep. the comics and all of that kind of stuff. I got big back into it in a big way, and and me and Pete um, actually went on on eBay during a bit bit of that sort of early eBay days where right. where the toys weren't too expensive, and actually pretty much got every single figure from year nor up to up really? to the end of that that period and then just got a little bit burnt out on it i think and and uh, peter ended up selling most of it on ah. on ebay again so reduced the collection practically back down to to zero held on to a, a, a few figures which i've now got and and given a give it to the kids and and yep. you know they're big into playing with with those all right well it sounds like we've got the right man for the job in the uh, co-host seat so that's a good start uh let's find out in a minute what he thinks about the current run of comics but before we get to that we've got a new segment it's called action figure fiasco Action figures, we all love them. Action figures, they bring us joy in our daily lives. Action figures, evoking memories from our childhood. But now we're grown and we just can't stop Buying plastic till our wallets pop When will it end? Who can say? Cause action figures are part of our DNA Some people say maybe we've gone a little wacko But action figures bring us joy like a rainbow They are so hot like a splash of Tabasco Now it's time for action figure fiasco Now it's time for action figure fiasco Right, yeah, this is a new segment. We will, don't worry you toy fans, we will have a vintage toy segment later in its usual spot following the comic talk. But we've got a new segment where, as regular listeners will know, the Chief has been throwing his money down the drain in that collecting hole called Six Inch Action Figures. And I pretty much get a delivery every single week of a piece of plastic that I don't need in my life. And what we're going to do here is we're going to have a little look at what has come through the mailbox this week for the Chief. So, just going to reach over into the cabinet. As it is a G.I. Joe themed podcast, let's start with a G.I. Joe. And I've got myself here a uh, six inch classified line Snake Eyes. Uh, You own this figure, I believe, as well, Mark. Yeah, I got them. I got the whole first wave when it first came out. So, yeah, interested to hear what you think. 
first thing I'm going to say is on cosmetically this figure looks great looks really good I was a little bit concerned that he seems to have a bit of a pea head the head looks a bit undersized let me just grab a uh, let me grab a Wolverine here let me grab a Wolverine okay so I know even though this is Hasbro Marvel Legends Hasbro Black Series Star Wars Hasbro but they still skew a little bit differently on the scales even though they're all made by the same company they're yeah. all six inch figures but this is not too bad. Wolverine is probably a little bit too tall when stood up against the snake eyes and his head looks a bit more well proportioned. But I don't think snake eyes head, I think it looks a bit undersized, but it's nothing too concerning. Um, fantastic articulation, loads of weaponry here. Two gripes I've got. One is his torso is very loose, like on the ab crunch. But if he's in a standing up position, that top, it does kind of hold is yours a bit loose it is uh, very okay. yeah loosey-goosey yeah love the texture on these trousers you know almost kind of a matte roughish feel as opposed to there's some glossy parts of armor pierce armor pieces on his um, upper body the the grenade belt i would probably lose because it kind of uh, is a bit loose and swings around a bit and the other problem i've got is the backpack even though the strut on it goes through the um, that, that grenade bandolier yeah. and then into his back it doesn't kind of sit flush on his back on my version okay just kind of rides up a little bit yeah i think i think because of the bandolier and stuff that you're fitting in them two of them together it does you know, it doesn't yeah. completely fit perfectly and i think it, it it's quite loose so yeah it would probably wouldn't stay on with uh, but you with can you can get him into loads play. of cool poses the ankle's got a really nice rocker on it um there's loads of movement in um you can get his bicep it's a double jointed elbow it can go past 90 degrees um loads of ninja poses that you can get him into here the I, i'm not sure about the weaponry the knife is cool um but obviously this line is going for a bit of a futuristic vibe which is why they've kind of given him these sci-fi guns yeah easily swapped out i would imagine with some kind of either call of duty guns or some i guess um generic um, six-inch scale pack of guns. Is that what do you think? Yeah, there, there's ver there's various packs out there that people are using as, as replacements. Um, yeah, I think I mentioned before on 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 chat that that um, the Iron Grenadier, the vintage, vintage Iron Grenadier, which has that oversized Uzi for oh, yes. for a small figure, yeah. that actually fits in Snake Eyes' hand. Not too not too bad. And okay. actually, you can still pop on the uh, the silencer on the end of that. Right. I'm going to uh, check that uh, out. I don't uh, mind the pistol too much that he comes with here, apart from the, the hole it's got in it. Yeah. Because obviously the hole is there to go onto the strut of the of the futuristic submachine gun. Yeah, but and, and there's no the there's slide. no Oh, he has got a trigger. There's no trigger on the on the gun either. There's a trigger on the pistol, which isn't no, I'm looking at it now. Actually, it's not that good. Is it? <laughs> it's, yeah, the, I think that's probably the weakest point of that that figure. And actually, the deluxe version of the figure yes. did come with a, I think, a, an Uzi. All um, oh, right. So it's got more realistic. Okay. But overall, overall, uh, pretty pleased that I have got the other Wave One figures. So I'll probably open one of those up later on today at the weekend. Uh, maybe we'll feature that on next week's episode. But I have got one other to discuss. Um, and let me just get it out of the cabinet. And it is the 6-inch 40th anniversary Boba Fett figure. Ooh, nice. The Empire Strikes Back 40th anniversary. And this figure looks incredible. The sculpt on it, the paint, um, the, the moulding, everything looks great on this figure. I do have one big beef with it though, and that is there are molded pouches kind of hanging off his belt and for that reason you cannot raise his legs upwards. Mm. You know, you can't do a can can front kick <laughs> because they just get in the way and that is really if he's Can a I... display figure in your case just in a kind of standard neutral pose, that's fine because you don't need him doing anything. But if you're into toy photography or anything like that then you're going to struggle to get dynamic poses out of him which is a real shame and it's it's really nixed your moulin rouge uh, star wars diorama that you're planning exactly i was well into build i was about 50 percent into building that stage so i'll have to think of something else for disappointing that, but... and i saw the photo of that does it come with like uh, that clear display stand so no so i had here? i'll put the, post, the pictures up on the socials um it i had bought some 
stands that come with almost like arms that you can ratchet around in different positions. It's got a little grabber hook, so you can. It's for flying figures or figures with jetpacks, so you can pose them almost mid-air. And I bought that separately on eBay, but that will clamp around pretty much any six inch figure's waist but uh, he looks look. lock he looks very cool i suppose you don't need the the knees to be coming up when he's in the flying poses but he looks really cool on that so yeah um excellent and more... i've got a big question for you before, yeah, go on. before we move on has mrs chief noticed all of these packages arriving <laughs> uh i tr- well yes to a degree but i i if a, if something does come and she's in, what I generally do is, and she hasn't noticed that the postman's been, I put it in the outside shed, and then when she's gone to pick up the kid from school, I run down, get out of the shed, and get up into the loft before she can see. There we go. There you go. Uh, trick to the know. trade right there. Uh, right, that's enough action figure talk. Uh, what, let's talk about what the, the show was founded on, and that is comic, so it's time for Comic Talk. Comic Talk. Oh, Comic Talk. Barry Hammer writes them, Chief and Mark discuss them, whoa. Comic Talk, oh, Comic Talk. Barry Hammer writes them, Chief and Mark discuss them, whoa. Okay, doing things a little bit differently now on Talking Joe. Uh, we've got someone else who's going to guide us through the Comic Talk. Take it away. Favourite cover. Okay, so we're going to look at favourite cover. Rather than go through every single cover, because there's variants, we've got four issues to cover here, 226 up to 229. Uh, let's just pick out our favourites. So uh, I'm going to go first, actually, here. So I really like the standard cover by Gallant to issue 227. And this is Cover Commander, hands behind his head, Destro and Baroness behind him, kind of wrist rocket poised for his head. Baroness is loading her Luger and... Cobra Commander doesn't look too afraid. He's got the eyeliner on his mask, which is nice touch. But um, I just kind of like the simplicity of this one. It looks almost like blood splatter on the wall behind him as well. Oh uh, yeah, that's uh, the colorist there adding a little bit of uh, texture yeah. just to make sort of make the image pop a little bit. Yeah. More. Do you like this one? Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting that that Gallant sort of developed this this look for for Cobra Commander with that eyeliner eyeliner slits yes um yeah it feels like almost it's it might be hom- homaging something or referencing something but i can't quite put my finger on right okay on you're is. normally pretty good at spotting the the homages <laughs> so yeah. uh given a bit of and, research you can maybe well maybe you'll find something but um does he does he normally have those big gold circle clasps on his cloak i can't uh, remember i've definitely seen them before okay um right. yeah i think depends on the on the look but okay. did you notice there on the cover we've got Destro appearing with his his scar, which in the previous issues was has been a little bit on and off. Ah. And do you know can do you know where that's from? Where no, where did, I, I probably do, but I've forgotten. Where did he get that from? So that was in the the showdown at the uh, the Silent Castle that they they had with the Blue Ninjas, and you might remember ah. that he was mashed up in the face with uh, an en- energy saber. And at the time, he he said that his mask of marriaging Molly Steel is the strongest metal on earth and impervious to an energy saber, uh, which is clearly destro bs because now he's left with a scar and and i think sort of in the last couple of issues uh, they've been a little bit inconsistent in, of the inking of it so sometimes it looks like it's there sometimes less so but i think now it's canon that that destro uh, destro's mask has a okay a scar. well the one thing i'm gleaning from that is it's good that you're on because that's the kind of uh, picking peanuts out of poo that s jobs <laughs> would have done so good good we're carrying on that trend i like it i like a man who is picking out the details so well done for that oh yeah uh, I was thinking also we haven't really given Mark a name when I say we I mean me so <laughs> I was thinking um, when we did a test record you put up Marky Mark as your as your name and I think Marky Mark is you know it's been done before but obviously Marky Mark was with the Funky Bunch so that's your new name Funky Bunch okay <laughs> right so let's see fun- let's see if we if we can improve on that over so, the course of the- <laughs> uh, Funky Bunch what's your favorite oh cover? dear I don't know if I'm going to answer this, but um, so I think my favourite is actually two two six. So that's the one. The of, regular one. The regular two two six with uh, SLL Gallant cover yeah. with Snake Eyes on the front there in his new outfit. That yes. Doubtless, we'll talk about a bit later. Front and centre, shooting, uh, um, you know, towards the audience and uh, flanked by Scarlet and, and Stalker on either side. Yes. Yeah. And. I think, I strongly think, that that is actually uh, an homage to the classic issue four, which ah. featured Hawk 
in on, on the front in a beret sort of in that pose of sort of having a pistol in his hand and shooting towards the audience flanked ah. by uh scarlet stalker rock and roll i'm just looking it up now G.I. Joe flash four. rock and roll in the background some other character i've forgotten to mention ah uh, yeah oh yeah and, i see it yeah 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 and funny enough that is actually the cover that i've just had uh, a commission based on by uh, Ian Kennedy, the mighty Ian Kennedy, that yes. has actually arrived in the last uh, week. So, I'll and the chief that. dog has been privileged to have been shared. That um, obviously, I'll let you share it on the socials. But uh, it is an absolute corker. That is um, when when you see that, listeners, you will literally blow your nutsack off. It's that good. <laughs> it's, so maybe if you if you like your nutsack, don't 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 view yeah, that. Be image, careful. But uh, it's yeah. incredible. Well done, sir. Well done. Yeah, your, your berries will be buzzed at the very least. Your berries yeah. will be buzzed, yes, yes. So, all right, well, let's uh, just have a quick recap so we know where we stand. I just wanted to, to mention, the, the I guess, an, another little detail on yeah. the covers. 227, classical variant. So a nicely painted sort of style. Oh, of... uh, yeah, I've only got the small little thumbnail for that one. Yeah, um, so does it look got... nice in full image? Well, yes, it's based on, uh, based on the classical painting, which was the theme for these variants, that particular month they had like duck tails in the style of Van- vincent van gogh and, and that ah, kind of thing okay. so this this one with cobra commander on the horse was actually a reference to napoleon crossing the alps by ah, Jacques louis david right. painted in 1801 so, very good and and there's another variant which uh, is a homage did you spot it uh, probably not know me. <laughs> so let me point you towards issue two two nine, and the cover of cover it's by Robert Atkins, of Baroness, hugging a gravestone. Yes. No. Oh, that's a dead Ring devil. Any bells? Dead yep, devil. That's it. Frank Miller. That's it. Frank Miller, the mighty issue 182, where Daredevil's hugging yeah. that Electra headstone. Yeah, yeah. And also, quick, now I'm on there, quick shout out to Brian Shearer for his subscription cover for that issue as well. I really like that one, Deep Six and um, Shipwreck um, with Polly. and Just loads of guns pointing at him. It's just like a fun, fun cover. Yeah, it's got that vibe of, I think it was one of the G.I. Joe uh, animated series sort of intros where, where I think Shipwreck or Deep Six has kind of... Uh, in in that sequence where they're kind of uh, I guess walking along and get spotted or something like that. But, um, I don't right. know if that's my imagination, but okay, uh, that kind of vibe. No, good stuff, good stuff. I'm glad to, uh, we paused to cover those actually. Um, okay, right. So last time on a real American hero, Cobra Commander believes he's disposed of Cobra members that were planning to strike against him. But with Destro saving all his men from the Silent Castle and Zartan leading his group away before any harm could come to them, the Commander's Cobra Nation might be in more trouble than he thinks. Okay, four issues here as discussed. I don't necessarily think this forms a storyline that has a, an ending. It definitely feels like it does go into the next issues. We are going to yo-jo it on the issues that we have read here but um i think what we need is um plot Plot breakdown so yeah it's very much a continuation of of what's come before and as as you say does it finish as a sort of complete unit in itself well the last words of the final issue of the four issue arc are to be continued yeah (laughs) uh, which suggests possibly not so it's four issue arc cobra nation and we start the arc with uh Cobra Commander handing out lobster rolls with Dr. Mindbender to the good citizens of uh, Spring, Springfield, yeah. whereupon he uh, spots a young girl called Dawn Moreno, uh, who is looking to join the school lacrosse team. So Dawn here shows off her, her lacrosse skills and takes out a, an entire squad of uh, heavily armoured guys to, to score score the goals. So who knows where she got those skills? Yeah. Who knows if we'll ever find out? I suspect not. Okay. And her, her kind of, her, her part of this four issues is she then gets recruited, doesn't she? And we find out that she attempts to stop an assassinate, assassination attempt on Cobra Commander, but then all after all that plays out, she ends up in the brainwave scanner and, you know, shock horror, ends up implanted with Snake Eye's memories. Now, would you say that was kind of... There's a lot of stuff going on, but would you say that was the main plot or arc through this through these issues? Yeah, probably. Like you say, there's there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in this, this arc. There is... It's covering 
a lot of different threads. Yeah. I think that's probably probably the the main one that what we're seeing here is that dawn origin playing out through the course of these four issues. Yeah. But yeah, there's a whole other bunch of stuff go, going on. So the Joes Joes are investigating the Cobra sites uh, that, that were where those Cobra renegades had previously. Been. They meet the mysterious ninja from Trieste, yes. and uh, Sean Snake Eyes is given some ninja training yep. with some uh, serious ninja BS going on <laughs> there. Maybe we'll get to that in a in a, in a minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, should we play that? Should we play the jingle for, for ninjas right now? Oh yeah, ninja bullshit. Ninja bullshit. It's all the time. Di Joe and ninja bullshit. So the the mysterious ninja from Trieste has taken Snake Snake Eyes. I'd like to say version two, but then people are thinking that's the guy with the visor and stuff. So let new Snake Eyes into the forest, and he's being taught the thirteen esoteric finger knits. Sure is the mystic techniques inscribed in the secret scroll of the Arakashi. Ar- Arishikage. First time I think I've said that out loud, so apologies. <laughs> what, what I feel like we we need, if, if you're reading that that sequence, is almost uh, Chris's bedoinging machine because he, he's what what the, the his training involves, and and I think I'll try and I might have to do this in like a Beavis and Butthead voice or something. Is <laughs> is is he says as follows? <clears throat> do you feel it throbbing, <clears throat> straining to be released? <clears throat> now I want you to push that energy <clears throat> into your arms into your heads it it lasts only a few seconds and then it can be can't be done for at least six hours there we go <laughs> very, good. very good that's your that's your ninja session of uh, of the week <laughs> was it wasn't my favorite bit all of that glowing hadouken effects and, and yeah. things i like i like my ninjas to be a little bit more grounded in reality yeah but... and he now has a psychic shield which means he can uh, i guess it's a deus ex machina isn't it it's it's a uh, get out of jail free card whenever he needs to um deflect a bullet or stop a sword strike or something like that or or grasp the ephemeral yes yes of course <laughs> of course um, okay um, okay so what what else was going on? So so Cobra uh, the Cobra Renegade as I'm calling them so so um Tomax and Zaymort and yep. Cesspool and uh and, and Crystal Ball and Co. They invade Springfield with this elaborate plot to brain to brainwash the, the citizens, make them compliant, all to get in front of uh, Cobra Commander, uh so they can ask to be friends again. Ah, that was a question I had. I didn't understand why they had taken over the town of Springfield's video feed it was it was so they could be hypnotized by crystal ball and be put into a more compliant state i think so that they could get past all of uh, cobra commanders oh right so it's purely so that the these higher up the, the hierarchy of the renegades could get into cobra yeah. commander's lair that was it exactly okay. yeah it right. felt a little bit <laughs> a little bit sort of uh, over the top but there we yeah. go yeah that that kind of how does that play out they just um they they say that they want back in don't they this is where you get that that dawn or the assassination attempt and dawn jumps up on destro and then yeah, Zorana's threatening there. to stab him right through the eye that's it that's it um and then we all we all part company happily and uh, elsewhere there's a uh, new character, which we'll, we'll come on to in a minute, uh, in Oli Astan, new Joe, and a remembered kind of Cobra associate, and a new new character that, well, I don't think we've heard uh, Cassandra Knox before, or not, but I, I don't know, you'll, you'll tell us when we talk about that. That's kind of the, the, the plot in, in as it is, but um, yeah, let's move on. Talking points. Okay, so I've got a few things I want to talk about here. You've probably got a few things as well. The first one I'm going to kick off with is, uh, aside from, you know, we kind of discussed the psychic Snake Eyes stuff, but what do you think of Snake Eyes new outfit? Yeah, I like it. So so it's interesting. They sort of made quite a big point of, of the reveal. It's sort of probably the flashiest page almost of the entire four issue arc where they're sort of... They, they've got a full figure snake eyes and they're detailing exactly, you know, what is in his new lay, loadout. Yep. Um, Larry likes his gun porn and now he's talking about his TAR-21 in place of the armor of the the visor, night vision goggles, the, these new gas um, respirators on the side, a uh, uh, sidearm with suppressor, etc. Properly, tr- properly tricking it out. I'm not a fan. I think the, the headgear makes... Him look a bit insectoid, kind of almost almost looks like a co- stock cobra 
viper kind of feel i don't know just don't like it at all oh dear i think it's all right i think i think it's interesting that they're sort of doing this sort of new design with with snake eyes because i guess for much so much of the uh time to date whenever we're seeing a new uh outfit it's being driven by a toy but i i think and i you know let me be corrected but i think that this is is very much a comic driven design that, right. that hasn't actually appeared in toy form uh, first but yeah i am very happy to be corrected on that if it if it is drawing particular uh, inspiration from a a look that we've seen somewhere else yep yep interesting interesting i mean i think it's more evident that they're kind of pushing well i, I suppose when he got introduced he effectively took snake eyes old costume he took his code name he took all his training and pretty much assumed you know his role next to scarlet and it was almost as if okay larry's been told you got to kill him but larry didn't want to kill him so he's not killed him because we've now got a replacement who is to all intents and purposes the same person this is the first time we i guess we've seen i don't know it's only happened recently but this is the first indication that he is moving away to become his own entity almost yeah so i guess he's got his brand new design his own favored weapons he's also getting some ninja training to to you know finish off the his his, his training so you know making distinct that you know he's still got he's still on his journey with his own distinct set of skills okay uh anything you want to specifically talk about from these issues uh, yeah, let's talk about uh, the female cobras that that you talked about. That so yeah. you think we got a couple of new ones there. So so we've obviously got um, Bombshell as the the new Joe who's introduced on Bomb the training. Strike, I think, is it? Bomb Strike. Yep. Yeah. I, uh, I I keep I've, in my notes. I kept on writing it down wrong, and yeah. uh, now I've said it out right wrong as well. But yeah, there we go. Bomb well, this, Strike. This, this was and kind of tying on to what you've said. I've actually written down. This is another talking point for me. Is I've actually written down new characters and specifically four new female characters. So yeah, let, let's carry on. Bomb Strike yeah. being one of them. So Bomb Strike. Yeah, I think we've seen her in the background of an issue relatively recently. But this is her probably being fr- front and, and centre. And, and, and she, so she seems to her... be some kind of um, cover insertion um, operative. I don't know. I don't know what her kind of specialties are yet. But she's gone into Aliastan, and this is where she encounters that Cassandra Knox woman. Yeah. So she meets. Dr. Biggles Jones, first of all. Yep. So she was the developer of the Railgun, who we saw in that G.I. Joe featuring Snake Eyes arc of uh, 15, uh, 135 to 140, where they met the Transformers. Yep, yep. And we last saw her in the pages of the comic being taken into space by Megatron. Yes. I think her story continued on in the pages of Transformer, Transformers generation two so so she's making a, a return and dr cassandra knox is actually returning from a one issue appearance in oh. issue 153 the shadow oh. of the bat okay which was that issue where scarlet was being hunted by uh, a new tricked out bat and was one issue that wasn't uh, actually written by larry hammer so, ah, so interesting it, a return of a character that he didn't actually originate, but one of those sort of fan favourite characters who, who who will will have inevitably been uh, asked for many times. Both both of these uh, these right. female cobras, okay. I imagine, regularly asked for. So yep. it's probably succumbing a little bit to to fan pressure there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we also get a character called Akane or Akane. I'm not sure how you're supposed to pronounce that. She yeah. is a female character who was leader of the Red Ninjas. Yeah, so they describe her as a, a sort of mysterious ninja who's who's not been seen for many years, but she only looks about ten. So <laughs> <laughs> whether she whether whether she was five the last time that she was spotted with her amazing ninja prowess, I don't know. But yeah, that's sort of obviously been set up as a as a potential character uh, yeah. to to follow up on down the yeah. line because and... of course we need more. Yeah, I was going to say, and do we really need more ninjas? By the way the storyline's going, it looks like we're getting another one because, as we've pre-mentioned, uh, Dawn was another introduction here and she's now getting Snake Eyes memories. So we've got four, four, uh, like you said, maybe Cassandra Knox and Bomb Strike have appeared one issues previously, but it, to all intents and purposes, we've got four new characters who seem to be, all female, who seem to be getting... Uh, are going to be getting some good page time coming up do you think this was an intentional move by larry or idw to yeah put more diversity into the book 
It definitely was, because did you actually notice the big gimmick from issue 228? No. So As if you look at uh, Brian Shearer's variant cover to the issue, that uh, oh, actually, yeah. Okay. Uh, 228, variant cover. Ah, all the females, yeah, yeah. All the females. So so we've got uh, the cover is actually echoing who's in uh, the the issue. All female issue. There is no men in that issue at all. Oh, shit. See, this is, again, the stuff I didn't even pick up any of that. So so there's a thing called the Bechdel test, which is a measure of representation of women in fiction. Right. And it asks whether a, whether a work features at least two women who yes. talk to each other about something other than a man. And you can definitely say 100% that this issue passes that test because wow. lots of women, lots of talking, lots of action and no men. I would not. I, I read this twice again this morning and did not even pick up on that until you've mentioned it right then yeah i didn't even actually think about it too hard my myself it was it was it was triggered by a comment in the letters column from uh, from the editor who who said uh readers you've read what might be one of my favorite gi joe ara issues ever eagle-eyed readers might have noticed something unique about this issue i don't want to spoil it for everyone that hasn't figured it out but give it another read and see if you catch it uh and I was like, "What? What is it?" And then, uh, yeah. All right. So you didn't spot it the first time round either, then. No. Yeah. Without that comment, I probably wouldn't. I probably wouldn't have actually consciously figured it out. So yeah, no. It's, it was a. It was a good. It was a strong issue, and I think you know, lots of strong characters there, and it didn't feel like, you know, it obviously was a little bit forced because it was intend, intended, but yeah. But we, you know, on first read through, didn't really notice it. It felt yeah. very, uh, very natural to see see all of those characters. And yeah, I was going to say, any any other talking points you want to? Uh, so uh, have yeah, a look at? for this one. So Duke, um, his his wife has been captured and been away for, you know, many years. Yes. And then uh, returns to him, but he's back in uh, back in work, um, and he and he says. I just need to get my routine normalized again, Roblox. Claire has applied for a position at a major hospital in Ogden and she got the job. Uh, there's a weekly C- C-130 supply run between the pit and the hill AF- uh, AFB so they can hitch a ride on and we can have weekends together like normal people. They say normalized and normal people a couple of times in that bit. Yeah. But his wife and him do not have a normal relationship. No, you don't no. you don't go uh, years and years with your wife being held captive in uh, off off in the middle east somewhere without mentioning it maybe once and then when she when you're reunited you don't try and rush back to work the the following day and say yeah we can just see each other on the weekends yeah. that's fine yeah and that's this normal. for me this is the most interesting plot point that i want to see play out because all the other stuff we've kind of seen before but this one where at the end of the issue where you know she's pulled a gun on jane and she's got the she's got some call from some some random guy um there's people in paris and benzene and you don't really know what's going on then she's is she deep deep undercover is she a double agent but lots of intrigue here and this is the storyline that i really am most interested in seeing play out yeah and and i think it was s job said before sometimes you can read the writing in the in the book and think hold on what has larry been watching or reading and and possibly he's been he's he's been catching up on his box sets of homelands in this one so right. we've got a, a brainwashed uh, american who's who's been away for a few years back in and, and acting like some sort of a sleeper agent who's yeah. been uh, awakened yeah but it'd be interesting to see yeah. uh, how this one plays out definitely that's intriguing that's intriguing for me one other uh, one other thing i've got to touch on here is actually um who is jody because they mentioned cover girl and uh, who else is it it's lady j she's lady j it? go yeah. to to see a woman to basically tell her her daughter's dead yeah so so this is a really deep cut and uh, it's no surprise that you didn't actually tweet okay. what was going on here. So this is Jody Craig, who right. is codename Shooter. So you might remember from uh, the pages of issue one of G.I. Joe. Yeah, there's a crossed they, out head. There's a little head there and it says underneath Shooter. And it yeah. was done as a throwaway joke to the editor at the time, Jim Shooter, uh, 
Marvel. Ah. And it's something that's played on uh, Larry's mind ever since then. And, and I, th- I think was a little bit annoyed about because it was done, you know, put in there by the letter or whoever is a little bit of a, as a, an in-joke. Right. He's like, no, we don't have a shooter on our team. Right. And so he actually revisited that. Uh, in the pages of the Devil's Due production series, G.I. Joe Declassified, okay. where they talk about a secret origin story of, of the Joe, where they talk about this character, Shooter, who yep. is uh, Jodie Craig. And in that book, uh, she dies. And at the end of the book, uh, there's actually a scene that very much mirrors this one, where Hawk visits her mother in the same church uh, to let her know that she had died. And and so this this is this is sort of mirroring that at the time he, he was sort of saying that, you know, your daughter is, has died um, and and it's like, how, you know, how did uh, someone who's just in the chaplain school sort of die on a mission? Yep. Uh, whereas now they're, they're saying, uh, you know, she was very brave and, and she's got all of these medals that we can now tell you. So it's kind of an update to that. Are there, there's no breadcrumbs to, to suggest that at all, though, is there? If you'd never encountered that G, the Devil's Due series, yes. not really. Okay. You'd, you'd have had to, you'd have, had to uh, have found her name and Googled okay. it. Okay. Well, I've got that. I've got all the Devil's <laughs> Devil's Due books, but I haven't read them for 15 years or whatever. So, yeah. um, obviously, but, I'm not going to remember that. What, what I found interesting about that scene was that they got the the mum got sort of very argumentative in one bit, uh, talking about uh, the different Bible versions that Scarlett was quoting from the the uh, NIV versus the KJV, the New International right. Version yes. versus the King Get James versions, which I think is the the typical Hammer sort of providing little factoids okay. in, in 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 sort of everyday speech yeah. that um, is you know just a little bit of knowledge that he's trying to leave her leave her in 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 there. Yep. Very quick shout out before we move on to the next thing, uh, but I, I really liked and I'm looking forward to seeing this play out. Hopefully, it does. We get a few pages, a scant few pages at the start of two two nine of the whale with uh, torpedo, Ooh, yeah, we didn't talk about this uh, at all. cutter, deep six, and shipwreck, and we get some eel action, very James Bondy, spy who loved me, and it's absolutely fantastic. I love it. Eels up inside, ya. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice little uh, just five page sequence, I, th- I, th- I think. Uh, one, two, three, sort of four under... pages. Only four okay. pages. And yeah, it, it sort of starts off the issue, but then we don't see it again. So, no. so we'd expect, I guess, it to be a plot point that gets picked up probably in in the the next one. So, yep. so that out... that and the um, the Claire situation are the two things I'm, I'm most looking forward to here. But uh, yeah, as as always, Chief is a little bit confused. Am I stupid? Right, I've got a question, and uh, maybe you're the man to answer it. Now, if you recall, Cobra Commander believed he had blown up the Zartan Destro enclave of Renegades, but then it turned out that Tomax and Zaymot had somehow switched the video feed, so Cobra Commander didn't... He saw that it had been blown up, but they didn't actually blow up. But I thought that got broadcast out on every television network now here the joes send a recon team in to investigate so they would have seen this building blown up but when they get there everything's still intact but they don't mention anything about they're not like holy shit this should be smoldering rubble but it's just clearly still an office block what's happened there is that they've seen uh the footage on wcbr your news our way that's the internal cobra news channel right which uh we see being invaded i think in issue 226 so it's a uh, an internal cobra channel that they that those guys can see because they're in a cobra office but the gi joes don't have access to because their intelligence gathering is duff okay so they were <laughs> just sending a recon team to a a known location that's not right. knowing that it's blown up all right very good very good sir very good sir yeah okay what have we got next i i had a little i had a, a, oh. a sort of uh, a bit of con- confusion to uh to, to ask about so well you're asking the wrong man here but go on we we the jinx jinx and scarlet go into into a, a tardis shop with which is you know full to the brim of weapons yes isn't this the kind of thing that GI Joes should be targeting, targeting to shut down? Most probably. <laughs> An illegal, massive industrial weapon shop yes. that is probably, for the most part, catering to criminals and terrorists. Unless they are monitoring it um, and they are they're aware of what's transpiring, they're just waiting for the big sting. 
intelligence gathering yes. i like it give yes. that man a no prize <laughs> so their intelligence <laughs> on uh, cobra being able to hack cobra tv is poor but their intelligence on being able to spy on weapon shops is good we've learnt. <laughs> okay all right uh, we've got another favorite coming up what is it s jobs favorite, favorite line, line of dialogue, dialogue. okay um i am going first again so my favorite line of dialogue actually comes on um is it page two of the first issue 226 and cobra commander mindbender in this i actually own page one where they're oh, do in, you yeah where they're in the truck yeah oh, brilliant uh, i'll put that up on the socials i bought it off brian shearer on ebay just because i thought it was just so yeah, ridiculously bonkers. silly um <laughs> you're either on board with the silliness here or you're not so i think i am it's it's funny because actually i picked page one that this page this page that you've got yeah. is my favorite dialogue ah uh, so from, well i'm on page two series. my it, the favorite line of dialogue is cobra commander saying no we don't serve ice cream only boiled anthropods on baked grain products <laughs> and what's yours then yours is on page one we are met mingling with underlings my mind bender establishing rapport with the hoi polloi they'll love us for this there is much goodwill generated by grati comestibles especially such patrician victuals as lobster eyes rolls why the very name triggers endorphins <laughs> there we go it, there's there's nothing quite like uh like a com- cobra commander bit of uh monologuing yeah. Uh, yeah. is uh, very good yeah. okay uh, now it's time for things that we might have spotted I, I spy, spy with, with my little eye. eye okay so this is a uh, little easter eggs that we might have spotted or just things we want to point out very quickly I really like the you've mentioned it already the addition of the TARDIS in that shot <laughs> I thought that was again fun. I think this is the third TARDIS that we've had in the series okay and uh, my favourite though is in the all female issue Baroness rocks up in the stinger Love it. Love a cameo Ooh, from a stinger. Yeah. Really, really cool. So Very good stinger. Did you, did you spot anything? Any little cameos? I spotted a, a few, few or... little things. I liked, the, I liked on that same page there was a reference to uh, Ozymandias from the poem by uh, Shelley. Yep. And uh, the cent- uh, where Cobra's talking about, you know, that the, he'll leave behind an enduring legacy, whereas the actual underlying theme of that, that poem is the inevitable decline of uh, rulers with their pretensions to greatness. Oh, wow. Uh, you nice deep on the Easter egg there. <laughs> and here's a little one. It's especially good for you with, with owning the page. Yes. Uh, the logo on that uh, lobster van is Ebira Edibles. Yes. What does that mean? So Ebera is a crustacean kaiju film monster mm. who first appeared in the 1966 film uh, Ebera Horror of the Deep. So in the grand tradition of, of things like Mothra and Godzilla and, yep. and all these kind of things. So uh, deep cut there from, uh, oh, nice. I'm assuming, Galant. In, I like this little reference in in two two seven to uh, to law vipers. Yes, there's a, there's a figure that's dying to be made. <laughs> Law Viper, love it. And on two two seven, there's a, a lovely little bit uh, in there where the Cobras, after they've sort of had their little uh, confrontation with Cobra Commanders, they're sort of regrouping and having a little discussion in the uh, Springfield Diner. And there's that shot of them from the outside of the diner looking in, which is a uh, is a again an homage to the uh, famous painting by Edward Hopper from 1942, Nighthawks. Uh, probably the most famous example of the American real- realism movement. Wow. Uh, you've set a precedent here for deep cuts, so uh, you've got to live up to that each and every week, my friend. Only if Larry writes them and, yep. and uh, Shannon draws them. And only if you're not broken and replaced. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's time for uh, one more little bit of comic talk. Okay, new segment, uh, new, well, not new segment, new part of the segment. Who is your MVP for these four issues? MVP. So, yeah, we've not talked about her too much, but uh, actually Bomb Strike would be my MVP. Okay, so nice. There's a nice little bit of uh, an action sequence with with her in, in these uh, couple of issues where she's confronting uh, Dr. Biggles, uh, Biggles Jones 
and uh yeah particularly there's there's that little bit little bit of action where they're sort of tumbling down the uh the elevator shaft there and she's uh chucking out she's getting so, somehow grabbing onto a cable attaching it and having a discussion all at the same time in midair uh, as well as grabbing uh, yep. as grabbing dr knox so some some proper ninja skills in there as as well but it's uh yeah it was it was i think a very good introduction to a a brand new uh, character with a properly, you know, fleshed out uh, appearance, rather than just sticking it as a as a little cameo in in the back of a panel somewhere. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I don't know that we've had necessarily that many in in this new IDW run where Larry has gone uh, gone to the well of characters and picked one out that that exists, particularly from the modern era, and uh, inserted it into the um, into the into the into the story in such a a prominent way way so yeah it was it was good in it i think it injected quite a lot of uh energy into the into the story in much the way the same way that you know uh s jobs was talking about how the uh the old era run was propelled along with a lot of energy by the addition of all of these new vehicles and characters that that larry was being asked to in, introduce yeah and that meant that that you know it was creating a new story ideas and new d- dynamics e- e- each time regardless of what's going on in his own uh in his own sort of story world he, there were certain things to it to include and so i think you know this this created a lot of uh, energy in propelling it along in a in a similar sort of way there was that, that that little sequence as well sort of made me start thinking about the gi joe's being this super classified task force that has to remain super secret so uh you know which is why they gave uh when dealing torres the uh the kudos for that mission bef- before but it, it seems like uh it seems like cobra despite the despite uh bomb strike being uh, a brand new gi joe and this is her first major mission uh they've already got her file card to hand recognize her by sight and know everything uh, about her so by keeping gi joe secret i don't know who they're keeping it secret from because it's sure as hell ain't cobra yeah yeah <laughs> and i think uh, i wanted to say zarana as my mvp but i don't Ooh. think she's in it enough nice little bits of um play with dawn where she gets her knife stolen and then kind of cuts her hand when she takes it back and then with the paintball stuff but i'm actually going bomb strike as well pretty much for all the reasons you mentioned and prior to her going on mission you get the kind of the standard trope of you think she's on a mission but it actually is just mm-hmm. a training exercise but that's kind of a nice introduction yeah. and then you get to see her on mission so it's, it's laying the ground for as well. it as well which is you know it's thinking uh, thinking more than one page ahead yeah thanks yeah. larry yeah. um so um, okay cool <laughs> that's, so that's good. we've kind of suggested that this isn't really the end of an arc but let's give it a yo joage anyway for the issues we've just read so as the i'm gonna let you go first this time um what, what what's your yo joage here yeah I, I sort of stopped reading the the issues around about this this point and so anything i have read i've completely forgotten so it's 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 like reading an entirely new uh set of gi joe stories and, and um i like the way that that larry's sort of balancing all of these different storylines and, and laying out track for stuff to, to 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 come the art is really on point from shannon as always so i actually really quite uh enjoyed it so i would give it um i don't know seven solid seven seven yojo colas from funky bunch the chief i don't know i i feel like the majority of it we've seen before it's okay uh, i'm coming in with a six yep that's it that's the first yo joe which is on the board for the all new talking joe uh, hopefully we can talk about toys mark talks about toys ho ho he talks about gi joe he talks about all the toys from the comic book and the animated show mark talks about toys mark talks about toys okay what have you got for us uh, mr seddon Okay, so I think let's continue this this uh, this theme. So, do you want to have a, a guess about who I am going to talk about? Cover girl. Cover girl. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, I guess she probably hasn't been talked about before. But not so, her. Not her. <laughs> it would have been yeah, interesting, but uh, not. There's uh, there's an, there's a really obvious one based on what we've talked about so far about who maybe we would talk about. Oh, bomb strike. So. Uh, Bomb Strike, who featured in 2005 Venom vs. Valor with a tw- uh, version 2 from the 25th anniversary in 2015? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. Not her. Um, <laughs> put me out of my misery. Okay, I'm going to send you a WhatsApp in the grand tradition of the show. It is, and I hope 
This hasn't been covered before. There's a good chance that Chris might have done it. But it is the Crimson Guard Immortal covered in issue 226 from 1991. Okay. Now, I am completely unfamiliar with this. I didn't even know this was a character, let alone a toy. Yeah, so so it featured this guy featured quite prominently in issue two two six, which is kind of what made me decide to feature feature him. So I'm just trying to flick across to to the the page. So it's as Tomax and Zaymot are coming out to invade the TV station. Yep. They're flanked with a a brace of, ooh, I'm counting at least eight there. Uh, Crimson Guard Immortals okay. uh, behind them, and uh, they're a, uh, a a figure that hasn't really got much airtime in the book uh, at all. They came out in 1991, which was, you know, as the line was beginning to flag a little bit. A lot of people were sort of, uh, were, you know, outgrowing it by 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 that point, who'd been, you know, young collectors uh, originally, and and sort of at that period. They were going a little bit back to the well, and they were beginning to issue some V2 figures of some of those original fa- favourites. So I think in the same year they had the version 2 Snow Serpent and the version 2 Eels, and they had uh, Ali, version 2 Ali Viper coming down the line as, as well. So it, very much in that kind of spirit, they, they're sort of thinking back to those classic Cobra villains, well, troopers. And, and sort of reissuing them with a with an update. So this this is one of those. So it's, uh, the Crimson Guard is very much a sort of update to the uh, original uh, Crimson Guard. So and, these guys wouldn't be running around next to Crimson Guards. They're not they're not uh, different specialties. They are effectively just updates on the same person. The same. Yeah. So in the in the file card, there's not a huge amount that actually differentiates them from from the original Crimson Guard. Do you wanna do you wanna hear the blurb? Oh uh, yeah, give me the blurb. Yeah. So, Crimson Guard Immortals are fanatical super soldiers who swear a fearsome oath of absolute obedience to Cobra Commander. Advanced weapons systems marksmen and martial arts experts, they are the most formidable fighters in the Cobra Legions. A CG, when not serving as a personal bodyguard to the Head Snake, is involved in covert operations around the country under deep cover, assuming an apparently normal occupation and frequently running for public office. The Immortals are lawyers or accountants who pump iron, wear body armour and carry big guns. What they can't get by stomping and shooting, they'll get by suing and auditing. So the the main, I guess, differentiating factor between these and the original, uh, you know, Cobra yeah. uh, Crimson Guards, uh, are the big silver chest plates. Yes. Um, are you a fan and, of this? Are you a fan of this figure? And, and they're giant guns. So they had these massive uh, double-barreled missile launcher. Uh, with a nice little play fit feature where you put in the missile and you can flick them and they'll fly across the, the room. So for me, I loved the uh, original Co- uh, Crimson Guard. Of course. And I think that's a, a design that is close to perfection. You know, we talk about top, top tens of our figures. The Crimson Guard's definitely going to be in there. Yep. And it's very hard to top perfection, which is, I think, the shadow that uh, the Crimson Guard Immortal will fall under but you know for those fanatical fans who want to have their army builders yep. and want to have a uh, a crimson guard subdivision yes then then sort of a nice little extra design yeah. and speciality to fill out those ranks i don't I'm like sure the name very... i don't like the name crimson guard immortal just doesn't it's a, sound a right. little bit arbitrary isn't it yeah it's like let's let's say crimson guard and add an extra cool world cool word to slightly differentiate now, it from what's that. that hanging down his right leg is that part of the gun is that yeah that's magazine like a, or something from the gun oh a, that goes around to the backpack ammo, does it an ammo, an ammo belt that ah. connects the machine gun bit of his gun Got to it. his uh, backpack okay kind of like a slim down version of rock and rolls almost a little bit like that yeah that same kind of okay. uh, vibe and he's got the he's got two of them so it is that kind of double-handed okay um look that the rock and roll all right. He's growing. The said. figures actually. The more I look at it, the figures growing on me a little bit. But um, like you say, it's difficult to top or one up something that was so good in original format. But but yeah, he's, I think he's he's okay. I don't I don't think he's a stinker at all. But yeah, you'd ex- you'd expect him. You know, in in you know playtime yes. as it were. That you'd you'd expect this guy to be more like the 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 heavy hitter. Yep. Um, Crimson. And guard. what year so, was this? So Sorry, breaking out the. Uh, the launchers this is 1991 and interesting that larry didn't include him in the marvel run then yeah it is interesting it's yeah i don't i don't know why the they overlooked him in yeah. in that that run 
But I guess he was such a such a fan of yeah. the original Crimson Guard that that why shoehorn in this guy. Mm. Well, good stuff. Um, always happy to talk about um, characters that you know I'm not necessarily aware of or haven't seen before. Well, happy to talk about any characters to be honest. But uh, there'll be more toy talk next week. But right now, you're listening to Talking Joe, and now for something completely different: the Star Wars Galaxy. Sure has a lot of playgrounds. Playgrounds. Jedi Knights, Evil Sith, Bounty Hunters, all doing the rounds. Doing the rounds. But there's a guy so cool. The Mandalorian. Mandalorian. Now expand your mind and be a Star Wars historian. Historian. It's 10 Minute Mando. He's chasing a star. It's 10 Minute Mando. He loves Beskar. It's 10 Minute Mando. In a galaxy far, far away. Whoa, what is this? This is not G.I. Joe related. That's right, people. This is, uh, we're breaking up the show. This is a new segment called 10 Minute Mando. In fact, uh, let me go to my, how do I do this? Go to my clock. I'm going to my stopwatch. I'm putting 10 minutes on the clock go this is a section called 10 minute mando we are going to be discussing episodes one and two of season one of the mandalorian uh, until we get after four weeks then hopefully season two will be out and we'll be discussing uh, each and every week the new episode of the mandalorian as watched on disney plus channel so we just fancy the break we just fancy talking about it and i'm sure there's many joe fans who are also star wars fans so uh, with that in mind let's go we're 25 seconds deep into our 10 minutes <laughs> i watched episodes one and two this morning uh, hopefully you've watched them otherwise this segment yep. is going to be shorter than 10 minutes what do we think good Okay. Is that the end? That's the end. Now, <laughs> I remember when these came out, I was lukewarmish on them. I thought, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm down for a Star Wars live action show, but I wasn't 100% sure that a character that wasn't going to talk much as the lead was going to be my first choice. Watched them, thought, yeah, this is okay, but I thought very middling. Now, this next time around on the rewatch, enjoyed episodes one and two much much more than the first time round, which is quite pleasing for me yeah it's probably just overcoming that little bump in the road where you've got an expectation of what it's going to be yeah. and it not being that thing yeah but yeah it's definitely its own its own beast and it's it's coming you know it's coming from a different place in the star wars universe which is very much particularly this first issue a, a gun slinging sci-fi western you know that introduction yeah uh, very you know almost the very first scene he's framed in that doorway like a, a classic western gunslinger yeah, yeah. swaggering into a, swaggering into a, a bar a saloon let's say yes and i've got can i can i put in a, a massive fact drop now yeah because you already so the the guy in the suit a lot of the time wasn't pedro pascal the who, who voices mando right but uh, some some other uh, body performers and, and stunt artists and, and so on and so a lot of the on-set work is is done by another guy called brendan wayne right and so that that this guy brendan wayne is the grandson of john wayne oh no way quite quite a cool little yeah. thing in the west in the tradition of those uh those westerns oh nice yeah yeah because yeah. that that opening scene like you said very westernish really like it sets the character out all you need to know in those first five minutes he's a badass you don't mess with him if he wants his bounty his target he's going to get it and you know freezes that guy in carbonite on a ship early on which shows you he's not messing around and really like that bit where you know obviously anytime Carl Weathers pops up is great so mm-hmm. that was cool and that that scene where you first see the stormtroopers that's kind of a goosebumpy moment because you know when was the last time you know you saw classic storm classic stormtroopers yeah. uh, dirty dirty stormtroopers yeah, yeah really really <laughs> nice and um, the guy I don't know who the, the guy is the actor I can't even remember what the character's name is but the the foreign guy who's giving him the deal so we're talking here about Werner Herzog oh is that Clint. Werner Herzog okay yeah. director so this this is the director and, uh, and narrator of documentaries and, and whatnot. Ah, so, okay, right. Uh, I didn't realize that was making him. A, a rare on-screen appearance. appearance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was great. He was really good. Really kind of, yeah. you know, scumbagish, sinister kind of guy. And um, yeah, re- really enjoyed it. And like you said, it turns into a big shootout. IG assassin droids showing up. That was quality and very violent. I thought though, very <laughs> Lots violent of killings. Yeah. yeah, especially when you go on to episode two, he is just murdering Jowers for fun. <laughs> like those poor Jowers. <laughs> proper, proper. But um, the how obviously the reveal when when you saw the reveal of episode one for the first time, and it's this mm-hmm. little 
uh, Baby Yoda thing, which for me, I still don't like. I think it's the worst thing of the whole show. That stupid little Baby Yoda thing should have been yeah, assassinated think... in, in episode <laughs> one. Obviously, it's a big part of uh, the show and a big part of the overall arc. I think it's been somewhat sullied by all of the all of the merchandising on the on the back of it if it was its own thing yeah with, without all of that then i think it would be a, a cleaner purer uh, viewing experience but yeah. but yeah let's let's not have yoda merchandise all over the place please yeah but do you remember did you did you remember the reveal and did were you aware of the spoiler did you know what it was going to be um I'm struggling now. I tried my damned hardest to avoid the spoiler. I don't know if I actually succeeded or not because right. it was just everywhere. But I, I tried my hardest. Uh, but okay. yeah, I, I can't remember exactly what. Yeah, I what obviously happened can't in that, remember. But um... that minute. But um, what what struck me about that, particularly the first episode, was about how much they're just trying to embed the Star Wars universe in it in all of these little, um, you know little ways uh, sort of that that you know just show a genuine love for that for that uh, world you know you've got that um you know the the, the alien with the with the long nose who's that, oh, who's yeah. that snitch from snitch from um, episode 4 yeah garandan um, yeah yeah he's he's like ooh, uh, he's like ooh. the taxi taxi yeah. man he calls yeah, the taxi yeah the taxi man calling up for the guys from the the rank yeah. you had uh you had the the squid face uh Guy oh, the and yeah. and the uh, and just as that that speeder came up to the taxi rank as it as it as it were and it sped sped away that you know, there's such a big echo of that 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 shot of Luke speeding along yeah, in uh, tattoo Tatooine yeah. and you know the oh when they were when they were going up to to meet the client that eye on the stalk oh, yeah, popping yeah. out just like a Jabba's palace yeah. you know that that big boxy robot woodling uh woodling along yeah um and just sort of utilizing that the alien races that already existed in that universe like um the bosk uh style aliens that that ambushed them at the episode uh, the beginning of episode uh two yeah yeah very cool very cool um like you said it's um oh and salacious b crumb oh yeah being roasted on the fire <laughs> that was lovely and one in a cage yeah it's good it's really good and um what struck a me monkey. though yes. what struck me though as being quite a bold choice is you'd think that they'd have three episodes to kind of set up this opening arc and the plot and where it's going but then episode two is a comedy episode you're suddenly chucked in <laughs> with a load of jowers uh dancing around trying to eat the yolk out of an egg it's it's, it's madness love it, though. it, it That's, i thought episode two was fantastic <laughs> it was a lot of fun just him Ah, oh, just in blasting those jowls, oh, and chucking, chucking them out, off the chucking top out of the, the sand windows. Crawler. Oh, he's absolutely brutal. Him, him getting up to the top of the sand cr- crawler, getting shot by the energy bolt, yeah. pausing for just that brief m- millisecond before falling back, just like R two. Yeah, uh, yeah it's side. He's just on a mission, and then. <laughs> but they, you know, despite wasting a whole bunch of their buddies, they, you know, they, they don't hold it against. <laughs> no, well, he says he because obviously he's met up with that dude. Is that Nick Nolte voicing the? Uh... It is Nick Nolte. Uh, voicing uh that guy the uh Kuil, i think he's called okay. i don't know how you pronounce um, the race it's like a uh, ugonaut something like that. ugonaut yeah which is when i first saw it i was like i think i should know who that is but but yeah because i guess of the, the beard and stuff it, it um but yeah, yeah. the uh ugonauts off of um they're on bespin aren't they um, um, in bespin and, and also used uh in the animated series right so in, in rebels i think yeah uh, but yeah, he he's he's tromping along on some kind of creature, and but you know he says um, to to Mando, he says Man, uh, Mando wants to trade obviously the parts of his ship for this egg, and he's like, yeah, but you did kill a lot of their their friends. And he's like, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. Um, but yeah, then he has to fight some creature to get this egg. It's oh, it's very bizarre, but um, a lot of fun I thought. And just whenever the Jawas are talking in that kind of dialect, I just find it very very satisfying and yeah, and yeah. humorous i just i just really like the jail i'm i said to uh ben offline um this morning after having watched it i was like i think i finally have come round to loving jowers always liked jowers but now having watched that i was like these guys are amazing i love jowers and uh, one little touch they had on the jowers they gave them red eyes rather than yeah yellow eyes yeah well that's that's because they're off-world jowers you can buy that off-world. figure as a black series it's called the off-world jower uh-huh. and because they are supposed to be native to tatooine and obviously this wherever they are on this planet it's never name checked i don't believe what this planet is 
but it's not Tatooine. Obviously, they have yeah, managed to get off-world, which is why they're off-world j- Jawas. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a deep cut in there somewhere where the name of the planet is written in, I think in the Star Wars language is Arobesh or something like that. Right. Um, so there is a name to the planet. Oh, is there? I'm not going to say it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Very good, very good. But, not Tatooine. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, I wrote down Lone Wolf and Cub, particularly around episode two. Yes. Uh, you know, the the sort of samurai, the lone samurai almost sort of transporting uh, the young yeah, child. Yeah, in yeah. The, it, uh, it definitely feels the like they're channeling quite a few different things, like the Western vibe, then that kind of feudal Japanese, lone wolf and cub, ronin vibe as well. It's like a mishmash all in the Star Wars universe with familiar nods to things we've seen before, but also new settings and new vibes, which is, um, you know, really good. So, yeah, I think, I think I'm going to enjoy this rewatch um then moving on to season two when we finally get there yeah whoa that, exactly? that is time ten up minutes. on 10 minute mando oh, we didn't even get to talk about ig11 well that's tough we got 10 minutes and that's the end of it you'll have to save that till the next one or, or dave filoni his first yeah, no, tough. live action oh. yeah tough um yeah, long time or, or um John Favreau writing yeah, no, that's done. That's done. Uh, ten minutes. All you get. It's not. It's not the ten minutes and twenty second, Mando. Okay, I get it. You have spoken. Yes, yes. That's the rules <laughs> of the game. Anyway, uh, more Mando next week. And if you want to skip it, at least you know it. You got to go forward exactly ten it's minutes. Exactly ten minutes. Yes, yes. Uh, mm. Right now, though, I don't think we have a listener question for this episode. But I think you might want to pose one for the listeners that we can cover on the next episode. Okay. All right. So, Marcus, listeners, a question. Marcus, listeners, a question. He's going to come up with a question right about now, and then you'll have a couple of days to answer it on social media before we then talk about it on next week's show. Very good. Right. Very good. So, my question for this this week is that uh, I'm doing a book binding project. So I don't. So Chief has definitely talked about this stuff on on the show before. He's got a sweet. Uh, bound collection of the original ARA books uh, you know bundle up about 20 issues into a hardback uh, collection uh, and so you can read them all nice together in the original format with all the letter pages and stuff and, and they display nicely on the shelf so uh, I've done that for a, a big bunch of the the books but not the original ARA run so I'm getting on to on to do that and the the question I want to ask the the listeners is that for that ultimate bound collection experience what should i be adding as bonus content in the back of the book so i like to have nice little extras in there so maybe like an interview maybe some uh, hard to find variant cover uh, art maybe uh, a little story that's only ever appeared online somewhere you know if you've got your 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 perfect run of gi joe what extras would you be putting in, in the back as, as additional content beyond just the comics themselves we're talking about the marvel run e- era so anything from that era are we yeah the marvel the marvel era issue one up to issue 155 uh, and excluding the obvious like special missions yearbook order of battle okay so maybe not maybe not a marvel published book a comic book but maybe like you say extra pin-ups or things that have been found elsewhere yeah okay that's good that's good because then you can say chief you didn't include all this stuff in your binds but the ones i did were very early on in my binding career so to speak so they're pretty basic and if i did it again i would probably do it differently but happy with what i've got but i think mark you're going to be able to produce the ultimate version of that so i'm really excited to see where you where you go with this and what suggestions people have got for including things and i've got my marvel special missions book winging its way back to me uh, as we speak so I, I should be able to share that on the socials yeah and that's brilliant. Got some nice extras in in the back of uh some original art scans and that kind of thing very cool very cool um right get your get your responses to that up in all the usual places you'll see the question up on twitter facebook instagram and all that and talking along those lines you can catch us in all the usual places that's twitter it's talking underscore joe instagram is talking joe comics hit us up on email it's talking joe comics at gmail.com or join the facebook group if you haven't done so already that's talking joe a gi joe podcast lots of good chat there uh, if you want to leave us a review on apple ipods on um on itunes you can do that the little purple icon give us five stars tell them that uh, chief needs a new co-host 
and um, <laughs> whatever you want. Just tell us, give us five stars, whatever you want. But uh, can the, are, are you active on the social media? Can people look at any of your stuff going on? Yeah, so people can find me on the uh, the Talking Joe Facebook group. Lots of posting going on there. And if they want to find me specifically, you can find me as uh, Sedonism. That's S E D D O N I S M at uh, Twitter. Yep, on the Twitter, you can find me Chiefy Two Shoes, Chief then a Y number Two Shoes. I'm on Instagram, to putting up daily art posts and some of my new toy photography very amateurish so please go easy on me and same on twitter as well but this ending has never been more apt because with all that said and done we will catch you down the road we've been talking joe and we're all out as co-presenters i mean joe's Joe's, whatever whatever we'll see you next week people bye-bye i'm done i'm not coming back